Hello, I'm John Johnston. I'm an Egyptologist, classicist and cultural historian. Today I'd like to speak to you about an exhibition currently on display at the St. Barb Museum and Art Gallery. The exhibition is entitled Unsettling Landscapes, the Art of the Eerie. And I'd like to speak to you about this exhibition in relation to an author who lived in Lymington. The thriller writer Dennis Wheatley lived at Grove House, Lymington from 1946 until 1968. Although only somewhat patchy remembered today, he was internationally famous during his life. And he wrote a series of 52 novels, all thrillers, all of them set in exotic locations around the world. He worked on the basis that most British people at that time didn't get to travel. And therefore he tapped into this desire for exoticism and exciting, interesting places. However, with his fourth novel, the third to be published, he was casting around for a new idea. He worked on the basis that occult thrillers had been extraordinarily popular during the Victorian era, but hadn't really carried over into the 20th century. Therefore, he decided that he would write a black magic thriller, utilizing some of the characters from his earlier publications. The Devil Rides Out was born. The novel concerns a group of friends who try to protect the youngest of their number from a coven of Satanists who are seeking the talisman of set, something which will allow them enormous power and will in fact bring about World War II. Save for the final few chapters where the characters career across Europe to the finale, the novel is largely set in England. And it's here that we see normally familiar territory can be eerie and dangerous. It's here that we see Dennis Wheatley's tremendous sense of place. And rightly so. He was born just around the corner from where I'm sitting now on Brixton Hill. And he went to school at Dulwich College just down the road where we understand he was eventually expelled for forming secret societies. However, Wheatley's father owned a wine merchant in the rarefied atmosphere of Mayfair. And it's easy to understand how the young Dennis Wheatley would have entirely understood the differences between the comfort of his suburban villa, the somewhat dusty academic background of Dulwich College, and the whirl and rush of life in the great metropolis. These are all elements which Dennis Wheatley brings to The Devil Rides Out, but they are seen through a glass darkly. They are all made somewhat more eerie. There is always the presence of the past, and it's a distinctly eerie past. Similarly, the scenes set in St John's Wood are decidedly unsettling, as he describes the exterior of Simon Aaron's home. Wheatley took great pains to describe the locations mentioned in his novels. And for the very first of those, Forbidden Territory, published in 1933, we see the end papers of the book being laid out as maps of Eastern Europe and the USSR, so that the readers might be able to more easily refer to the movements being taken by the characters during the narrative. This desire to fix a sense of place for his readership and for himself resulted in Dennis Wheatley incorporating his own home, Grove House in Lymington, into his Roger Brooks series. But Dennis Wheatley's fascination with the built environment and the surrounding landscape go far beyond the printed page to the point where he spends a great deal of his free time bricklaying. He lays specially formed crinkle crankle walls around his estate and they are the only elements of Grove House which still remain to this day. In 1961, he writes a non-fiction work entitled Weekends with Bricks, in which he details the enjoyment he derives from this very straightforward manual work, but also the impact that he is having upon the natural environment and the way in which the natural environment responds to his bricks. It's a fascinating work, and therefore it allows us some indication as to what's going on in Wheatley's mind when we come across elements within his novels 
where he's looking at ruined and dilapidated masonry. And as we turn to The Devil Rides Out, we'll see a great deal of that. It's been suggested on occasions that Dennis Wheatley's ability to conjure up uncanny landscapes for his narratives mirror in many respects the short stories of M.R. James. However, I think they are doing entirely different things. Dennis Wheatley is very, very keen to get on with the narrative. He doesn't want to become too bogged down in atmospheric descriptions, whilst M.R. James is very, very clearly about the atmosphere that he's developing. The short form and the novel form are two entirely different pieces of writing, and therefore Dennis Wheatley doesn't really, for the sake of the narrative, have the time to spend on such descriptions. I would suggest instead that Dennis Wheatley is far more inspired by the work of Bram Stoker. Wheatley was born in 1897, the same year that Dracula was published. And I can see a great many correspondences between The Devil Rides Out and Dracula. There are various narrative aspects, but the way in which both authors deal with their sense of place, with the descriptions of the locales that they're covering, I think are particularly fascinating. Using my somewhat battered copy of The Devil Rides Out from the 1970s, we'll go to the first of those locations. As Dirichlu's Hispano drove up at the dead end of the dark cul-de-sac in St. John's Wood, Rex slipped out of the car and looked about him. They were shut in by the high walls of neighbouring gardens, and above a blank expanse of brick in which a single narrow door was visible, the upper stories of Simon's house showed vague and mysterious among whispering trees. Ugh, oh, he exclaimed with a little shudder as a few drops splashed into his face from the dark branches overhead. What a dismal hole. We might be in a graveyard. The Duke pressed the bell and turning up the sable collar of his coat against a slight drizzle, which made the April night seem chill and friendless, stepped back to get a better view of the premises. Hello. Simon's got an observatory here, he remarked. I didn't notice that on my previous visit. Instantly, we see the strangeness beginning to develop. The fact that we have an unexpected observatory mounted onto a Victorian villa in St. John's Wood is very peculiar. And one wonders whether Dennis Wheatley is thinking about his own family villa in Brixton Hill and the ways in which the, these apparently affluent areas can lend themselves to strangeness and devilry. It's worth remembering that in Wilkie Collins, The Woman in White, Count Fosco, the villain of the piece, also lives in St. John's Wood. The idea that there are diabolical schemes and deeds lurking just beyond the closed curtains of these quiet, affluent, suburban streets is certainly distinctly unsettling. Although I don't want to give away too much of the plot of The Devil Rides Out, the narrative moves at quite a pace from London to Wiltshire as the Duke de Richelieu and Rex van Rijn attempt to track down the Satanists before they hold their great Sabbath. It's here that Wheatley spends some time discussing with a great deal of precision the layout of the villages in Wiltshire. The only strangeness is the inclusion of Chilbury, a fictional village, um, but the other villages, Imber and Tillshead and Easterton, Chitton All Saints, all feature within the narrative. And he even goes so far as to put down the timings, which suggests that Dennis Wheatley himself has traveled these roads, probably during daylight, in order to find out how long it takes to travel from one location to the other. However, everything has a different complexion when it's taking place after dark on Walpurgisnacht. And therefore, again, we get this real feeling of unease, being out in the countryside where there is no one else about, where even the local pubs are closed. There are no travelers in the street. There are only the Duke, Rex, and the Satanists, all heading for the great Sabbath. Wheatley discusses not only the growth of the trees moving in, 
around his main characters, but also the fact that there are pieces of broken masonry, that there are bricks that they're able to clamber over, which allow them entry deeper, deeper in towards where the Satanists are lurking. It's a very unsettling piece of writing, and yet not hugely descriptive. It's handled with the lightest of touches. Dennis Wheatley always wrote with a pencil, longhand, and an eraser. And he would do this because he wanted to find himself caught up in the narrative. He said that his spelling wasn't very good and that neither was grammar. And of course, his editors dealt with those things. But the important thing for Wheatley was the narrative and the strength of getting the story out to his readers in a way that they would most be able to understand. So we don't have huge, long descriptive passages, but we do have very detailed passages of what the characters encounter. And here in particular, I think the lead up to the Sabbath reminds me greatly of Bram Stoker's descriptions of Whitby, of walking around the town itself, being able to retrace the, the steps of the characters. When Rex and the Duc de Richelieu eventually reach the place where the Sabbath is taking place, Wheatley describes it as being in a natural amphitheater with a small lake beside. And again, we have this strangers of nature being encroached upon by this enormous group of satanic revelers. We also have ancient stones which form a throne. We also have, I suppose, the ultimate example of presence where there should be absence, when the goat of Mendes himself is summoned up by the Satanists and sits there atop this ancient throne. This is a natural landscape which has been entirely overtaken by otherworldly beings and by human beings who are behaving in an otherworldly fashion. Finally, after the terrors of the Sabbath, Wheatley's characters are able to escape in a chapter called The Ancient Sanctuary to Stonehenge itself. And there we see Wheatley contrast the ancient monuments with the more modern devil worship, which has been taking place just to die on the road, both still impinging and imposing themselves upon natural landscapes, but in quite different ways. There's a brief discussion about Druidism, which had become very, very popular during the early 1930s when the novel was first published, and about the Druid's desire to maintain Stonehenge, uh, which had only recently undergone a great deal of renovation work. And so Dennis Wheatley is very, very keen to draw all of these elements together and contrast them with what he suggests is a more ancient, far more dangerous religion, which is that of Satanism. Moving from the sanctuary of Stonehenge, Wheatley's characters then go to the home of one of their friends, Cardinal's Folly, an entirely imaginary house, set in beautiful English countryside with perfectly kept gardens. And Wheatley is at pains to describe this at some length. It's possibly one of the most detailed descriptive passages we have in the book. But Wheatley wants to describe it as a means of contrasting with the unease, with the terror, which has occurred in the wilds of the British countryside. But then we see during the course of events how this also is transformed by the power of MacArthur and his Satanists into a place of terror. Without giving too much away, events then mean that the characters have to travel across Europe. And the first of the places they go to in Europe is the home of one of the Satanists, which is sitting around the edge of Parc Monceau. And although this is just mentioned briefly and in passing, Parc Monceau is certainly worthy of discussion uh, because it is very far from being the typical Parisian formalized garden that one might expect. It is far more in keeping with the British idea of a park, far more rural in layout um, with twisty, turny pavements. And of course, in Parc Monceau are a number of follies. The most important of those is a small pyramid and it's been suggested that Cagliostro, the great charlatan magician of the 18th century, had performed various satanic rituals around this pyramid. So the idea that one of the Satanists 
lives in a house which is directly looking out onto the park is not so unusual. It's not a detailed description. My own description of Park Monceau is much, much longer than Dennis Wheatley's couple of words. Um, but he knows that a great number of his readers will be aware of this, will be aware of the pyramid and of its reputation. And therefore he is allowing this landscape to seep subliminally into his readers' minds. As the characters hurtle towards a finale in an abandoned monastery in Greece, we have a number of other discussions about the landscape, about the fact that at various points, they can barely see their hands in front of their faces. So we have this idea of nature taking control and of absence. And then suddenly, finally, we have the ruins of the monastery itself. And this ties in with the elements of the past, which have been there all the way through. This is a final reckoning between the Duc de Richelieu and Makata and the forces of darkness. And it is beautifully played out. Um, and one has a real feeling of the threat because of where it's located. We have these crumbling ruins um, with thousands of years of prior use. And this ties in absolutely with the themes being expressed in the exhibition, Unsettling Landscapes. It's worth pointing out that Dennis Weekly is rarely read today. His attitudes are not in keeping with modern society. He is very much a man of his time. There is a great deal of casual racism, a great deal of casual sexism to be found in his novels. However, The Devil Rides Out stands, I think, head and shoulders above his other works. Um, it is meticulously researched, although at various points there are whole-scale info dumps upon the readers, but it has, not least because of its locations, a real feeling throughout of unease.